Welcome everybody, members and friends of Global Minnesota to our Lunch and Learn today, where we're going to be hearing from our friends from Libraries Without Borders, Bibliothèques Sans Frontières. We'll be hearing from the international director out of Paris directly, Jeremy Lachelle. Uh, he'll be sharing a video in the very beginning, giving us a sense of their work around the planet. And then we'll be hearing from Aaron Greenberg, who's the executive director of Libraries Without Borders here in the United States. And he's been working extensively in our state of Minnesota. It's exciting to be with them today, hearing about these important activities around the planet and right here in our backyard. So let's start today with that video from uh, Jeremy Lachelle about the work of Bibliothèque Sans Frontières around the planet. Again, thank you. Thank you to our members and friends who contribute financially and support. It makes it possible for us to serve our community in this way. So let's get started with the video from Jeremy about their work, Bibliothèque Sans Frontières around the planet. Je suis avec Rachel Isolda, qui est depuis peu notre coordinatrice des programmes en Pologne avec Bibliothèque Sans Frontières. Depuis quand est-ce que tu es là, Rachel J'ai arrivé début mars. Depuis le début mars, oui. Donc là, on est vraiment à la frontière entre l'Ukraine et, 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 et la Pologne. Quelles sont les personnes qui arrivent Comment ça se passe eh ben, La population, c'est surtout des femmes et des enfants. Euh, de plus en plus, donc ça fait un mois donc euh, la situation euh, change et les personnes changent. Donc il y a eu ces derniers temps, j'ai observé beaucoup, de, beaucoup plus de personnes âgées en fait qui viennent. Alors justement, on se pose toujours la question en fait, de l'intérêt, de l'efficacité, de l'importance d'une association comme Bibliothèque Sans Frontières dans un contexte d'urgence comme ça Oui, bah, la Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, en fait, ça vient compléter les, les autres associations ouais. qui répondent aux, aux premiers besoins, à savoir euh, la nourriture, euh, le médical. Et ensuite, il y a un grand besoin en fait de psychologie, d'accompagnement et d'accueil des enfants. Euh, ils viennent d'arriver, ils viennent de sortir de leur pays, ils sont, euh, ils sont fatigués, euh, les enfants ont besoin de se, voilà, de se poser, de, euh, les mamans aussi. Donc euh, nous, grâce à, voilà, grâce à Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, on leur, on leur offre un vrai espace de, de calme euh, et d'évasion ouais. et un espace sécur, exactement. Ouais. On est dans le Kiev Center de Korchova. C'est un centre commercial qui a été transformé en centre d'accueil. Et ici, on a installé une Ideas Box, une de nos bibliothèques mobiles et innovantes. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est que le contenu des livres physiques qu'on peut trouver ici est un contenu pour la plupart en ukrainien. Ici, j'ai un alphabet ukrainien. Là, j'ai un livre pour enfants qui est en ukrainien également. Beaucoup de livres d'images aussi, de livres blancs, sur lesquels on peut projeter un certain nombre de langues, un certain nombre d'histoires. C'est un lieu qui est assez fascinant parce que c'est un espace vraiment sécur, un espace de calme où on peut se maquiller, on peut jouer à des jeux de société, on peut regarder la télévision. Et ce qui est magnifique, c'est de voir qu'on est accompagné d'une association locale qui s'appelle Ocha Lénier. Et c'est le principe de Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, on est toujours en fait accompagné par une association locale. On travaille avec de partenaires locaux, ce qui nous permet évidemment de travailler dans la langue des bénéficiaires. Elle ouvre à quelle heure cette bibliothèque Alors tous les jours on ouvre à 10h et puis le soir on essaye de fermer vers 18h. Parfois on déborde un petit peu quand on a des arrivées d'enfants. Et... Parce qu'en fait les mamans déposent leurs enfants et on, on s'en occupe ici, on les prend en charge, elles les confient facilement Elles les confient facilement, après il y en a certaines qui restent ici aussi, qui en profitent d'être dans l'espace et de se poser dans un petit coin pour lire, regarder leur téléphone, faire autre chose et, et rester pas loin de leur bébé. Donc là, on va faire un petit atelier maquillage. Euh... Qu'est-ce que je peux dire de plus Je trouve que les enfants viennent naturellement en fait, vers cet espace. Ouais. Entre les couleurs de nos box, les couleurs de toutes les peluches et puis tout le petit matériel, les petites tentes et les petites choses comme ça, ouais. ils viennent naturellement. Et puis d'être dans un endroit un peu hors du temps, joli, euh, qui nous ouvre vers d'autres histoires, d'autres euh, horizons. Dans quel état tu les trouves les enfants mmh, Ça dépend. Relativement calme, joyeux et curieux. Euh, beaucoup. Et euh, parfois il y a eu... 
Parfois, il y a des enfants un peu plus agités, euh, surtout quand ils viennent d'arriver dans le centre. Donc, ça veut dire qu'ils viennent tout juste de sortir d'Ukraine. Euh, selon d'où ils viennent, ce qu'ils ont vu, vécu, ils sont euh, parfois un peu plus agités. Et donc, en fonction, on s'adapte aussi et on, on prend un temps pour les calmer, pour dessiner. Ce qui est intéressant dans ces espaces, que sont les espaces de la bibliothèque, c'est que ce sont des espaces sécures, des safe spaces, comme on dit euh, dans l'humanitaire, mais des espaces surtout euh, où euh, on peut se retrouver dans une forme de calme, où il y a une petite musique, où il y a des livres, des espaces d'une douceur absolument inouïe dans un contexte qui ne l'est pas. Et Bibliothèques Sans Frontières veillent vraiment à ce que ces espaces soient préservés. Euh, les enfants euh, sont confiés euh, à Bibliothèques Sans Frontières. Ça laisse le temps, par exemple, aux mamans euh, de sortir pour aller se laver les cheveux, pour aller passer un coup de téléphone, pour aller chercher de la nourriture. Et c'est en cela où Bibliothèques Sans Frontières est aussi un espace euh, à mon sens extrêmement important dans ces situations de soutien psychologique euh, aux parents et aux enfants. I wanted to share with you this, uh, this video because uh, I think it's quite representative of the work of uh, Libraries Without Borders today. It's a true work in a, an emergency con context. And you'll see in this presentation that we work a lot in, uh, in Europe uh, or even uh, in the US, of course, uh, in more like, uh, I would say, like a long-term approach on education, on health, on uh, legal literacy, and all these topics. But there are many things in these uh, videos that uh, uh, show what we try to do by um, creating these safe spaces where people are, where they need access to information, secured and verified information, and when uh, people just uh, need like a, a space where they can uh, take the time uh, and for the children to take the time to be children again. You, you, you have also um, seen something which, which is very important for us in this video is the local partnership. So we always work uh, with local partners to deploy our project uh, in the field. But maybe I will rewind, uh, rewind a little bit uh, to give you like an overview of what we do, and, and then we can have a closer look to, uh, to our action for, for the Ukrainian emergency. First, some figures. Today, there is a big increase in the global number of displaced people and refugees uh, in the world. Uh, the, the number has doubled this, uh, these 10 past years. Two thirds of illiterate people in the world are women. Maybe more closely, uh, uh, more, more uh, clo clo close to us, 9% of 15 years old uh, teenagers in OECD countries are able to distinguish between a fact and an opinion in a simple text. So that means that 91% of teenagers are not able to distinguish between a fact and an opinion in a simple text. Quite frightening. And this last figure, 40. Three, uh, 40, sorry, 43% of low-income American families have no at-home internet access. So you can tell me all these figures have no relations one between each other. That's true. But at the same time, it shows, I think, a global gap or global needs in terms of access to information or it shows uh, these widening gaps between people who do have access to the information and people who don't have this access or who have like poor access. Or sometimes maybe the situation is more complex. In our Western country, we talk about infobesity, when there is too much information. So it's not only about access, it's also about accessibility, about what you do with the information. What we try to do at Libraries for Borders is tackle all this challenge of, you know, access to a better, uh, improved quality information and knowledge all over the world, um, uh, where, 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 wherever you are and uh, whatever your condition is. Uh, we have been working since, since uh, 2007 in more than 31 countries to empower our community worldwide by improving access to education and information. 
We do have now more than 130 staff and uh, we do have branches in the US, which is quite active and Aaron will uh, we, we, we'll talk about it in a, in a few minutes. We have some more in Belgium, in Italy, but we also have regional offices in Senegal for West Africa, in uh, uh, Central Africa, in Burundi, in Bangladesh for Rohingyas refugees, uh, in Middle East, in, uh, in Jordan, Lebanon and Iraq. So we have uh, this global presence and a, each time we try to do the same thing, basically uh, we provide three kinds of things. We provide innovative, cost-effective and mobile tools to bring access to knowledge where people actually are. And you had the example in the video of the ideas box and I will, I will, I will give you like a, a better idea of what it is in a, in, in a second. Uh, then we work on high impact content selected from our library of 35,000 physical and digital content resources in 25 languages and this is very important we always work in local languages we always work uh, to curate uh, and sometimes create the content that people need in a specific uh, context and specific uh, uh, location and of course specific language that means that we work in swahili we work in kirundi in burundi we work in in ukrainian for ukrainian refugees etc etc and then we work on training and specific support uh, for underground actors to increase their impact. So we always work through these partners to bring this access to, to information. And we do that in uh, five different fields, education and core skills, citizenship and social cohesion, professional life and entrepreneurships, health preventions, and this idea of inclusion through culture. And we do have specific projects for two particular, particular populations, with the welcoming and integ integration of refugees and the support to population in humanitarian crisis. This is important because, uh, you know, these five thematics, when you take them, you see that access to information at a specific moment in your life can be uh, absolutely crucial for finding the good job, for accessing the good else, uh, to get access to your full citizenship, and of course, to get access to quality education, to, to, to be part of uh, today's world. In 2014, we created the Ideas Box. Uh, so when I was talking about these tools, I, I will show you two tools, like the Ideas Box, which is this media center in a kit that you, you, you saw in the video. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredible in terms of design. It has been designed by the great French designer, Philippe Stark. Maybe, maybe you, you know him. He's the guy who designed uh, the, the, the yacht of uh, Steve Jobs, I guess. Uh, but uh, anyway, he did something better with the Ideas Box, which is this uh, portable multimedia center. So that fits on two pallets. And when you open it, you have these four modules. Uh, one with the library, with physical books, the other with all the digital resources and content, with tablets, computers, there's a cinema, and there is uh, uh, an internal servers, and everything's open up and creates a space of 50, 100 meters square in less than 20 minutes, and that gives you access to a full media center in this kit. It has its built-in generator, so it uh, covers its own power needs, and there are lots of tools for creativity inside the ideas box, including video camera, tools to make music, to play music and this kind of thing too. Uh, so uh, everything is about giving the, the power and the tools for, for local communities to create their own resources and their own solutions to the problems they face. Today, we have 140 ideas box implemented on five continents and all of them have been transferred to local partners. Uh, and this is the power of the model. We don't like deploy them by ourselves and try to sustain them from, from France. We always work with these local partners who uh, implement them and manage them uh, on the field. You have some picture interesting here. You have these uh, little kids in the center. This has been like ideas box deployed in Calais in France, north of France for, for refugees in transit to UK. Uh, you have this picture on the right, which is uh, ideas box in the Amazonian forest in Colombia. We have deployed 20 ideas box with the Ministry of Culture of Colombia after the peace treaty with the FARC uh, in villages where the, the state, the Colombian state had been absent for 30 years because of the war. And now three years after, five years after, it was in 2017, this ideas box, the 20 are still working 
and are like the local uh, library for peace uh, in these uh, areas. Uh, here is on the viewport in Marseille, a beautiful setting in refugee camps in Jordan or in Burundi. So lots of different setups. Uh, but not only in refugee camps, you see these pictures in France. We have 30 ideas box in France, I, I, I guess. And we have also some uh, ideas box in the US, uh, 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 including uh, the first one in the US was uh, implemented in the Bronx in New York. Um, other solutions that we deploy are offline internet solution because uh, you know that today 50% of the world population does not have access to quality internet. So this is a major gap in terms of access to information and knowledge. So we design offline internet solution to give access to rich media and content in areas with no or low access to the internet. That include the Ideas Cube, which are these nano servers that uh, creates a Wi-Fi access points and allow users to browse local application and content. But but also casual cards, which are SD cards that you put into your smartphone and you have all the content into your, your smartphone, um, like in a very mobile way. Uh, and you, without using any data, you have access to all these resources, including MOOCs, et cetera. This, uh, this technology has been awarded with uh, the MIT Solve Prize that you may uh, know. So uh, I was, as I was saying, today we work in uh, 30 countries around the world, and we work on very different, uh, big variety of, uh, uh, of context and of issue about social cohesion, education, peace building, integration of refugee, literacy, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe I will give like a very short uh, overview of our, our work in Ukraine be before uh, passing the mic to, to, to Aaron in the US. One child per second has fled Ukraine and become a refugee since February 24th. Uh, so 1.5 million children. So this is one of the biggest crises that the world has known in the, the past years. And as a particularity, uh, like, most, like the big, uh, the huge majority of refugees are children with their mother because the man has stayed, uh, in, has stayed in, uh, in Ukraine to fight. And this uh, caused lots of issues in terms of protection because uh, there has been lots of predation at the, the border. People were like coming to take the woman, et cetera. And lots of, uh, and lots of people have, have been kidnapped, et cetera. So a big, a huge uh, 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 challenge of, uh, of protections. So we have started to deploy 10 ideas box uh, for refugee information, protection, and psycho, 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 psychological support, psychosocial support at the borders of Poland, Moldova, and Romania. And uh, tomorrow we want to uh, implement new one in Ukraine. So the response has been very, very fast on our side. Uh, we have we have success uh, fundraising two million uh, dollars in like three weeks. That was like something very big for us. Um, we are still fundraising. Uh, like the, the needs are not totally covered, but uh, it was like a big push to start uh, and to 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 manage to to be very quick because in this kind of emergency, one of the the, the big challenge of the response is to be quick, uh, and uh, and all our teams have, have been you know mobilized to to create the content, the good content in uh, in Ukrainian, and to work with the local partners on the field to to, to deploy the, the, the ideas box. Uh, our branch in France, in Belgium, and in Italy uh, has been uh, mobilized as well a lot to create emergency libraries in shelters, uh, uh, wel welcoming migrants and refugees. And I think we have opened like 10 or 15 uh, um, uh, emergency libraries so far, and we are still working. And we are also developing a mobile app for French language learning from Ukrainian and Russian based on the casual technology. So that will be totally uh, available offline on SD cards. Here are some pictures, but you have seen the, the, the movie, but uh, you, 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 you understand quite easily the, the complexity of this kind of situation when you see the gymnasium with like tons of people. Uh, and that this was like uh, during like the peak of uh, people in fleeing uh, Ukraine. And today, one, one of the big challenge for us is to uh, be able to intervene inside Ukraine. Uh, mostly for the Western part for the moment, because the Eastern part is, of course, more dangerous, uh, because there are like huge needs, because there are lots of people who are internally displaced inside Ukraine. 
So this, this, this was like a, a quick overview of what we do at the global level on the specific response uh, to Ukraine, but uh, maybe more, um, uh, more close to, 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 to where you are in the US, we also work a lot. And, uh, uh, and Aaron, I give you the, uh, the, the microphone to, to continue and to, to give an overview of our work in, uh, in, in the US. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And um, just to move from the global to the local and then really to the local in Minnesota, I wanna talk a bit about the work that Libraries Without Borders US uh, has been doing here in the US uh, since 2015 and in Minnesota since 2019. So, you know, unlike some of the international development contexts that Jeremy was talking about, um, there is a very strong, uh, social, civic, digital, educational infrastructure here, especially with public libraries. But we know that there are still enormous gaps to fill educational, economic, racial, digital inequality in the US. And what we have done as Libraries Without Borders here is to help deliver the tools and resources and services of the 21st century library directly to underserved communities, to communities who are not going to the public library um, and to provide the kinds of resources that Jeremy was talking about that really empower families, communities and individuals with the information that they need uh, to thrive. So just some background, Jeremy mentioned at the beginning, 43% of low-income households in the US do not have broadband internet at home and just to think about that for a moment, what that means is that they don't have large screen internet access. It means that if they're going to apply for a job, they're gonna to have to do it on a smartphone or at the library, or maybe um, using free internet at a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts. It means that uh, children, school-aged children, if they're going to school online, are not gonna be able to access it on a computer where they can do their homework. And it's an enormous issue. There's been huge public investment to help solve this challenge, but we uh, are really doing a lot of work on the ground to do last mile or even last half mile or last block connectivity uh, for folks who are disconnected. An another statistic that really speaks to the work that we're doing, some 60% of low-income households don't have books for children at home. And 50% of low-income households uh, have not visited a library in the last year. 50% have, but there's a huge number of people across the country who for various reasons are not accessing the library and its resources. Can move to the next slide. So in order to meet this need for information, for services, for resources, for connectivity, for digital technology, we work to transform trusted community institutions and non-traditional spaces into places where learning and engagement and connectivity can happen. We started uh, seven years ago by transforming laundromats across the country into places of learning, into little libraries. Uh, an average working family is gonna spend two to three hours per week in the laundromat. And we thought, what if instead of watching clothes dry or scrolling on a phone, uh, children and their parents could receive resources, books, technology, connectivity, story time for kids, health and legal literacy for adults. So in 10 states and including DC and Puerto Rico, we've transformed corners of commercial laundromats into little libraries. Similarly, we've done that work in community centers, houses of worship in Baltimore, abandoned uh, municipal buildings in Puerto Rico to really turn those spaces into library spaces where learning, civic engagement, meeting, arts and crafts, literacy work can occur. And then finally, and I'll talk about this more specifically in Minnesota, we've worked in low-income housing. So when we first got to Minnesota in 2019, we thought, well, why don't we see if we can do more laundromat programs? We know how to turn a laundromat into a little library. But as we worked with, uh, at that time, Jen Nelson, the state librarian, about what parts of the state could really use this sort of work, it was clear that it was 
needed in urban areas, but also in rural areas. And when we started going to Fridley and Hibbing and more rural parts of the state or more exurban parts of the state, it became clear that laundromats were not necessarily the gathering places that they might be in Baltimore or San Antonio or the Bronx. And so we started to figure out how is it that we can meet people where they are, where they already live, where they already are comfortable to provide resources that they're not getting any other way. And so we started working with low-income housing and in manufactured housing in particular to transform storm shelters and community spaces in low-income housing into little libraries. So you can move to the next slide. Um, so, so far we have worked in a few areas around the state, uh, in Fridley, which I'll talk about in a moment outside the Twin Cities, in Hibbing, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later, and then in St. Paul, where we've done a few laundromat projects. But today I wanna to talk a little bit about the work we've done in manufactured housing and in Fridley, Minnesota in particular. Next slide. So um, manufactured housing is the largest source of unsubsidized affordable housing in the country. Millions of residents and in Minnesota, hundreds of thousands of residents living in manufactured housing communities. And these are communities that are often outside of urban centers face challenges with transportation, tend to be very low income. Um, and they're places where, as we discovered in talking to a lot of residents, uh, they're not always using the resources of the public library and where they're facing a lot of challenges with connecting to the internet. So we started working with the Park Plaza Cooperative in Fridley, which is a resident owned community. It's not owned by a bank or a landlord, but owned by the residents themselves who financed it. And it's a very diverse community, 60% Latino, 30% uh, Caucasian, and also with a large number of school-aged children. And we worked there to try to figure out what the needs were. We knew that there were serious needs, but everywhere we go, as Jeremy was talking about, we wanna make sure that we're providing the resources and the services that residents and community members really need to thrive. So next slide. Um, we talked, to every resident, we had town halls, focus groups, canvassing, and as we anticipated, internet, Wi-Fi, large screen internet access were top of the list, followed by language learning, health literacy information, digital devices, large screen digital devices, um, and then help for homework and other programs for young people. So uh, next slide, over the next few months, we worked with the community to transform their storm shelter, which had previously been a space that people only spent time in when they needed to during storms into a community center and a library center with modular furniture, with technology, Chromebooks, Wi-Fi hotspots, arts and crafts supplies, books and games for people of all ages in relevant languages, a community mur mural created by members of the community uh, with young people in particular. We worked with the Anoka County Library to do in-person and then virtual meet and read events uh, for young people and created a tech lending library and a back to school giveaway to again, bring the sorts of resources and services that the public library does, but directly in the community itself. Next slide. Oh, um, this is the different version of the presentation. There's a brief video I wanted to share. Um, let me share that, there we go. So Jeremy, if you wanna click on that, there's a brief video we have uh, produced about the work in mobile home communities. There. I moved here in 1998 and we were owned by an outside owner. I didn't know anyone around me except one person maybe. I went to and from work and never really got involved. We had potholes, we didn't have lighting that was proper. So you never knew what your water was gonna be like. We had broken pipes, we were shut off with water quite often. And if you needed help, you were basically on your own at that time. And then in 2010, we got a letter stating it was going to be sold and this came from the actual owner. And I thought, Oh man, what am I going to do? When I got the first letter, I sat for a couple days and was in tears because I had nowhere to go. You can't just pick up and move your house. 
that wasn't going to happen. Shortly after that, we received a second letter from North Country Cooperative Foundation, which is a nonprofit group that helps communities become a cooperative. We went to a big meeting. North Country Cooperative Foundation puts up a big piece of paper that says, here's what the property is valued at, $4.1 million, and here's what we're going to do to help you purchase it. And I thought, George is common folk. <laughs> where, where are we going to come up with $4.1 million, right? We voted yes. We have been able to establish a community that is an actual community where people know each other, they're outside, they're playing, we're babysitting each other's kids, we're helping each other with food, we're giving rides, we have elders, we have young folks, we have single parents, and we have the inevitable wish of a storm shelter. And every year I begged and begged, please get us a storm shelter. In 2018, we broke ground and built a storm shelter and asked for it to also be a community center. I was able to watch the process of us starting from nothing and coming to something. All the benefactors that helped and everybody that came around and just joined in to build something safe for the community. And then once Library Without Borders came in, it was just a blessing in disguise. My family and I, and along with the rest of the community, have benefited with Libraries Without Borders coming into our space to help not only have a storm shelter, but also have a community center space and a library on site. You want to know what the magic is. The magic is the people, the people that live in the communities, a board of directors that gets put together, who now have to learn how to be a board of directors, right? We are a very diverse community and we welcome everybody. And I love to see all the cultures that we have in here. And we learn from each other when we come together here in this space. Here we're pretty close. You really want to know each other because you're going to need each other. My family and I have benefited from living in Park Plaza Cooperative and uh, with the help of Rock USA due to the fact that had we not had them behind us, we may have been sold, we could have been displaced completely, and the place would have been closed out. Seeing everybody coming together, nobody really talked to one another. Everybody was kind of apart, and that's been a huge change with the community, watching everybody slowly start to help one another and band together as a community. And we can go out and share our story and let people know it is possible. It, nothing's impossible unless you make it impossible. It's for my kids, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. I'm, I'm just excited to see how it's going to grow and the future of it and where it's going to go. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Thank you. So, so as you can see in Park Plaza and that community, and other communities that we're looking to work with in manufactured housing across Minnesota. Our goal is really to help to extend the, the social, civic, digital, educational infrastructure and help to build community and create, as Jeremy was describing earlier as well, safe spaces for engagement, for learning, for education, for people to come together and to, to receive the, the resources and services and connectivity that they need to thrive. Um, final slide. So the next project that we're working on in Minnesota is up in Hibbing, Minnesota um, with the HRA of Hibbing, which is the Public Housing Authority. 
And there's a project there where we're going to outfit uh, a building of around 70 units of public housing for senior and disabled adults with connectivity, with digital devices, with health literacy materials, with broadband for the first time so that they'll have access to the internet, which they have not had in a large screen format um, ever in that building. And building as well, a community space, a civic space, a digital learning hub, essentially a, a library with all the services that one would get um, in the public library directly in the community where folks live. Other projects we're looking to work on, and, and Jeremy described this a bit earlier, but the Ideas Box, which is a, an incredible tool to connect uh, rural and disconnected communities to the internet, to resources. It's mobile, it's portable, it's modular, and we're hoping to have the Ideas Box kit up and running in the US in a big way um, very soon. So really excited that we were able to join you today. Um, thank you again. Uh, to Mark and Caroline and Tim and Guy Sanchegran for introducing us to begin with. And we'd love to hear your feedback, thoughts, and questions. Thank you so much. And um, I've got a couple questions and I think people will be lobbing some, but um, <clears throat> these are very, very different projects, but they meet your mission of seeing the library as uh, something that has a universal application. Are you also working in Africa, Asia, other places that you could give us a tiny piece of? Uh, uh, maybe I can take this one, Aaron. Yes, um, one of the big, uh, the big areas of work of libraries for borders historically has been uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Western Africa. So we work a lot in the Sahel region, in Senegal, a little bit in Mali, uh, uh, all these regions where there are like lots of um, questions for, I would say like for, for, for youngsters and uh, the question of uh, what, what are the, the possibility when you are, you are a, a, young, a youngster in this, uh, in this kind of uh, setup. And most of the time, you know, I don't want to, to be caricatural, but uh, uh, when you, you have like graduated and there is no job and you live in a rural areas in, uh, in North Mali, uh, most of the time, like the most attractive uh, options are either like the migrations, the exile to, to Europe, or radicalization with uh, some uh, terrorist group uh, uh, in the region. So um, I, I think there are like a, a, a very... Um, a very heavy missions in terms of access to, 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 to information and knowledge about giving these people like new opportunities. So we work a lot on uh, access to job training and also entrepreneurship. We work a lot in Central Africa, uh, Central Africa in particular in the Great Lake area in Burundi, in Rwanda, in DRC, in the Kivu region. We also work a lot in Haiti, uh, and we've been working a lot since the, the mm. 2010 uh, earthquake. And we just reopened like a big program in Haiti this uh, uh, last month. And um, the question of the difficulty in Haiti now is the violence and the, the risk for, for, for the staff. But uh, we try to figure out uh, ways uh, to, 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 to tackle this kind of challenge. And we work a little bit uh, in Asia, uh, mostly in Bangladesh today for the Rohingya refugees. Mm -hmm. And finally, we work a lot in the Middle East. Uh, we start with the response to the Syrian crisis. I know we extended a lot the, the project uh, in particular in Lebanon and in Iraq. So Minnesotans from those regions can find information about that on your website in French and in English. We have many people here from West Africa and East Africa, of course. But it also, I'm guessing there's a button for people who would like to donate and to make a financial contribution. And I see that the website is now up in the chat from Aaron, thank you. And Aaron, there's a story behind how this came to the US and how you got to Minnesota. Can you share just a tiny bit of that? Sure, um, I'll, I'll disclaim that I am the new executive director. This is my sixth month in the position. So uh, Jeremy might have to fill in if I, if I miss a few things, but we started in the US uh, in realizing that while there are major global challenges, uh, you know, 
facing folks in the global south and other uh, developing countries. In here in the US, there are enormous challenges as well around economic and racial inequality, and um, especially with access to education and information. In Minnesota, we started, I believe, because we had been working in laundromats uh, in New York, in California, in Baltimore, in cities around the country. And we were talking to a lot of librarians, public librarians about our outreach work. And in the course of, I think it was going to an ALA conference a few years ago, uh, Jen Nelson, who was then the, the state librarian in Minnesota said, this is amazing. And we really have a need here for our immigrant and low-income populations to bring some of these resources to the state. And it was through working with her that we came to realize that while we could do some of this work in, and it was needed in laundromats in the Twin Cities, that there was also an opportunity to really reach out into the more exurban, suburban, and rural parts of the state as well and, and meet people in housing in sort of where they live. So that's, uh, that's I think, how we ended up both in the U.S. and then in Minnesota. Of course, people here are, you know, have their own attachment to their library. That's a big thing. And then people have lots of the little free libraries. You can see them kind of everywhere. But I think that they have a commitment to the idea of public access wherever that might need to be. And many people here have come from refugee camps. So those are some that are 40 years old now and some are a million people. I mean, these are different experiences, but I'm guessing that that's one of the areas that you've seen heightened activity with the new, just sort of climate related, conflict related, you know, COVID related uh, displacements. Any um, reflections on how this is changing right at the moment and how other folks could be helpful in contributing to the evolution of your work in this sort of accelerated displacement moment? Maybe it's not a moment. It's not a moment. Yes, I think it's a moment. Oh. It's maybe, you know, we, we, we talk more and more about protracted crisis today. Right. right. Uh, so it's a moment that risks to last for a long time uh, because of uh, climate change in particular. Uh, we al already observe uh, like the migrations caused by it, uh, the transformation of, the, uh, of our Earth <laughs> due to climate right. change. Um, and I was talking about Sahel, for example, and of course there are like big challenges about like uh, the desertification of the soils, about uh, um, the the forced transformations caused not only by violence, by wars, etc., but also by this uh, transformation of uh, of the climate. So I think that. Uh, we miss a piece, you know. I, I was I was showing uh, like the, the the thematics we work on on education, on engage specific engagement, health, etc. I think one of the big pieces we need to focus on in the coming years uh, is this question of climate change and how we uh, uh, the the same way we do, for example, literacy or digital literacy or health literacy. I think we need to create some more, something about uh, climate change literacy. I don't know how to call it, you know, but it's also about uh, giving the tools to people to adapt to that, and not only, you know, to uh, uh, to to go to the big cities because uh, your your soil uh, is uh, is dry. Uh, maybe there there are some alternatives, and of course, uh, training, giving more more skills to people. Uh, it's not only about agriculture, uh, by the way, but uh, you know, like this transfer of skills uh, and this uh, uh, creation of community of practice where people can share, you know, expertise, experiences, et cetera, I think is highly important. But at the same time, we face this big challenge, which is the, the question of the connectivity to the internet. So that's why uh, with Libraries for Borders, we, we bring a piece between, you know, this kind of, uh, um, uh, I don't know, like resources existing out there and the people on the field. 
uh, and we are not experts on health. We are not experts uh, on, for example, educational. But what we do is like bridging the divide and creating like these bridges. So I will say at some point, so when we start like a new thematics, we need like this expertise. And at some point, this kind of experts and this kind of resources on climate change uh, and on good idea to, to face this climate change uh, uh, and this transformation due to, uh, to, 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 to climate change could be a, could be a good, good way to support us. Well, this is an example that comes to my mind, but- uh, yeah. Well, it's um, so very important. And at, at the Glasgow Conference of the Parties about the Paris Accord, of course, making climate uh, literacy mandatory was one of the elements in the various declarations. And I do hear now many networks of teachers who are sharing materials, organizations like in the US, what we call here Earth Day, they're devoted to that. So I think you are describing something that actually could uh, mm -hmm. surface and really become part of that, that bigger uh, you know, bigger puzzle. So those kind of topics like climate, there are these special moments, for example, the COPs, the Conference of the Parties. Next year, it'll be in Egypt, the following year in United Arab Emirates, probably Dubai. And the pre-COP for this year will be in Kinshasa, in Zaire, in Democratic Republic of Congo. Do you as an organization see those big mega gatherings expos, cops, you know, those things as opportunities for outreach and connections? Or do you uh, do educational programs with leaders there? Do you want to describe any of those activities? Uh, you're, you're, it's a good question. I, I think there's two ways uh, to answer this question. First, uh, we are not good enough at advocacy. And I think we should, uh, and this is in our strategic plan for 2030, we are like in the middle of a, a big fundraising to fund uh, a push for growth and work on this kind of, uh, on, on these global challenges and good global advocacy for, for, for more access to information, et cetera. Uh, and this is something we want to, to, to be better at, to be more present at this kind of big, uh, uh, big uh, venues uh, to, you know, for example, when you talk about offline internet, uh, when you go to the COP, for example, and you talk about offline internet, you you bring like a very con concrete solution on the table to broadcast mm -hmm. and to diffuse information. So uh, this uh, this can be a, a, a good venue for 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 for, for broadcast uh, or for for push or message for pushing our messages. Uh, but the other way to respond to your 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 to to respond to your question is more in terms of actions, because uh, it's a good example, the, the, the Kinshasa summit. Uh, because I will say like, in, when, it come, when, when the COP come to Paris or come to Dubai, you know, it's like, you know, the globalization is here, people are here, there are lots of, uh, la, uh, all the teachers walk on the event with the class and it becomes like a big thing, you know. When, when it comes to Kinshasa, you know that there is this gap between like people who are connected to the globalization and the rest of the countries. And in particular in DRC where the country is so huge and you take people in the east of the country, it's another country, you know. So there is a big challenge of using this kind of event to make projects and to make concrete operation on the world, uh, on the field for the populations. And it's a good way to use this kind of uh, events because um, I would say that it's a little bit cynical, but at a very political level for the local, you know, uh, decision maker, they have to do th things on the field to show that they, they have right. like- That you have to do something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, something. So good way, you know, it's a good way to, to push uh, some, uh, yeah, new new things, etc. So So it can be a lever, a good lever, yeah. I'm aware that this evolution, especially the focus here on affordable housing, was chugging along, and now we've begun to hit this crisis in affordable housing, and probably already Afghan evacuees homeless in the midst of trillion dollar and more than that allocations. There's craziness in this particular thing. Aaron, do you see that 
you're like the strong stories of how the cooperative organizing process then brought people together, you know, for other reasons, of course. Do you see that intersection picking up steam with this housing, you know, sort of spiking of housing and rental prices? Or is it a dampening? Is it a just such a body blow? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I see a lot of our work, we do end up working with refugee populations as traditionally defined, but also there, there are a lot of internally displaced economic refugees in the country as the result of the housing crisis. People living outside um, who are struggling with homelessness are in some senses refugees as well, refugees okay. from, um, you know, caused by the, uh, especially in cities, um, the extraordinarily cost of living that's been, that's been rising. I think that figuring out how we can meet the needs of the refugee communities of all kinds internally, whether refugees who are, uh, who are traveling to the US or moving to the US or who've already been here and are, are forced out is, is really key to what we're looking to do, especially in a place like, like Minnesota. And what we see ourselves is, is really is doing that sort of yeah, last mile, last block connectivity. There is enormous and unprecedented spending that's about to happen in digital equity and in um, you know, investment in our sort of digital and physical infrastructure. But organizations like us, you know, we can really be on the ground before that even happens. And to work with communities around, for instance, digital literacy, which is not the same as digital access. You can provide a device and you can provide internet access to folks, but it's not gonna mean much if at this point, 2022, they still struggle to use or are intimidated by technology. And so we see our, our role in part as paving the way for uh, the effective spend of all that infrastructure and ARPA funding um, which again is unprecedented, needs to be celebrated and, and lifted up. Um, but to make sure it's effective, there have to be community-based organizations on the ground working directly with the affected communities and ensuring that they're gonna have access to and benefit from that investment. An example being the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is an incredible way for low-income people to get access to free internet, but it's totally underutilized. And so it's a program we're working on signing people up for enrolling them in because it's a, a really transformational opportunity. Well, so we're running out of time and over this next year, many people will see this, the clock will turn, the conditions will change, some things will be the same. What is the final message you want to deliver knowing that this will be seen by many people but not in this moment over this next year, at least. Uh, you've got some big plans coming, Jeremy. It sounds like some things. Aaron, you're talking about the, the, the big wicked problems we're tackling here. What, what's your message for that, that viewer who's excited after hearing what all you've been doing? I, I, I would say that today there is the urgency of reading. Maybe it's not the good uh, terms in English, but um, I think we need to, to share and to understand this sense of urgency of giving access to quality information and knowledge to people out there. Uh, if we want to, to, to face, and if we want to create more resilient societies to face the big challenge that our world is facing today, including you know the challenge of uh, giving access to or uh, um, um, uh, just like managing, uh, uh, navigating through information, uh, more or less fake, more or less true, mm -hmm. <laughs> one's way into that. I think it's about the question of the resilience of, 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 of our societies and of our democracies. And uh, maybe, you know, uh, 50 years ago, the big challenge was uh, for people to learn how to read and write. Maybe it was 100 years ago, I don't know. 
I think today the challenge is uh, about you know navigating into this information, accessing to it, but also navigating to it. And so we need more than ever libraries, and we need libraries everywhere for that. Not only like the big building that we know, we need libraries in uh, in uh, refugee shelters. We we need libraries in uh, laundromats. We need libraries in our you know in our parks, in our cities, everywhere because. This idea of giving this space, which are like safe and trusted space from, for the community, giving access to them. And the, the thing which is incredible with libraries, it's like individual level for its own emancipation, but it's also a collective space where you meet mm -hmm. and create mm -hmm. with people. So there is this urgency and this should be the big cause of our century. Great, Aaron. Yeah, I, I would echo all of that. Um, the only thing I would add is uh, a quote that I love from the Susan Orlean book called The Library Book. And she says, libraries are physical spaces belonging to a community where we gather to share information. There isn't anywhere else that fits this description. And what we wanna do is expand access to those kinds of spaces all over the country, all over the world, they're essential for the economic, social, human development of our community and also for the health of our democracy. So that's that's our goal. Thank you so much for the work you to do, for the work that you're doing. Uh, I had the pleasure of reading that fabulous book, The Badass Librarians of Timbuktu. And I think that's another way that we will tackle this world. But our time is up for today, but there's much more to do and connect to. Carolina, take us on out. Just wanted to quickly say thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, we will be posting this video into our YouTube channel in the next few weeks. And uh, for those of you that registered, and uh, you will get this, this recording as well in case you wanna watch it from the beginning. Uh, thank you to everybody that made this happen. Thank you, Jeremy and Aaron. Thank you uh, to all of our partners and all of the members, and we'll see you at our next event. Thanks guys. Bye. Thank you very much.